G'day, I'm Rob from A Life That Travels. Welcome to Hong Kong, and I'm here with Cameron He, who has been here like studying and interning and working, not just here, but in Taiwan as well, mate. Thank you for joining me. Oh, no worries, glad to be here. Awesome. Um, you've had some pretty crazy adventures. Can you tell me about, let's, let's just start this conversation by talking about Taiwan and um, this incredible experience you've had, you know, working with school children um, via Skype and then meeting them. Yeah, so when I was in Taiwan, I was there for a year studying at the National Taiwan University. And they had run a really incredible program where you Skype with Taiwanese school children from all around Taiwan. So not only Taipei, but really rural areas, such as like the, the outskirting islands and like the real center of Taiwan, which is the indigenous school children. Yeah. So I spent a semester Skyping with them every, every week, nice. telling them about Australian culture, showing them Australian food, our way of life, like, uh, television shows, like basically every every part of Australian culture. And so after 20, 20 weeks of Skyping with them, the Taiwanese government, they pay for you to go visit them. Oh. So I took a bus ride for about six hours into the mountains of Taiwan, um, into this random village in the middle of nowhere. And we just got to see these school children that we've been Skyping for for 20 weeks. And despite having never seen them, you feel like you knew them, like you knew their names, you knew their story, and I was just in this in the dead center of Taiwan, um, and you would have never been there if it wasn't for this program. And just to know more about the culture of these Aboriginal Taiwanese that I didn't even know existed before going there. Oh, wow. um, that must have been like incredibly impactful. Yeah, it it was really strange because I had never heard about these people before, and. Yet I chose to go to this country to study and intern yeah. and I had no idea about their culture, their history and I had no way of embracing that and learning more about it. So this was just this incredible experience to go learn about it firsthand and yeah. actually meet them and see this village of almost only less than 200 people yeah. with no convenience stores, no, no real benefits of a city. It was just an outskirt tribe essentially. Incredible. And it was unreal. Sorry, but let, let me ask the kind of maybe um, strange question, but, but they had Skype. Yeah, they had Skype. <laughs> so their village was actually destroyed by an earthquake a couple of years ago. Oh, wow. And the, the government rebuilt the entire Taiwan village from scratch. So the, all the houses are the same. Yeah. So they installed the internet and running water and electricity. That's incredible. Yeah. Wow. And so when you got up there, what was it like? It, it was insane because we left Taipei at about like 6 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. And we were on a bus for what, forever, it seemed like. Yeah. <laughs> and these are unpaved roads. We're in this kind of like 12 seater bus. Yeah. And, it, and the roads are so bumpy. And so we're like bouncing around for three hours, going up mountains and down mountains. And then there was this valley in between like, in between these mountain ranges. And we were just bumping up and down. And, all of a sudden we landed in like this, this really serene area and it was, they had a lot of farms, they, just, they had fish farms, it was really a self-sustaining community. Wow. Uh, you know, I have, um, it, it's funny, I have, I have kind of no visual um, impression of what Taiwan is like. I mean, you've just talked about a landscape that I think I never would have imagined for, for, for that country, that place. Um, What's it like outside of that? I mean, okay, you've been to like rural mountains. What's Taipei like as a city? Taipei is this bustling metropolis. Yes. It's a real, really good blend of Chinese and Western culture. Yeah. So, like kind of like Hong Kong, yeah. they retain a lot of the, the modernization, but still blend in the Chinese elements. So you can still see um, buildings with Chinese characters. You can still see the design, the like philosophy. Like yeah. you look at Taipei 101, and it, and it doesn't look like a modern, like Australian building. It's, yeah. It has a bit of like Chinese history behind it, and they build that into the into the um, into the structure. And that's kind of representational of Taiwan. Like nice. you see this modern, like modern Seven Eleven store, and then right next to that, there's an ancient Chinese temple. Yeah. And they seem to go well together. It's it's this weird, strange, but incredibly interesting mix of, of culture and 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 life actually. Is, is it a fairly compact city? 
I mean, is it one of those things like everything's kind of like you look here over our, over my yeah, shoulder I mean, here, like it's 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 amazing, right? Boom! But then suddenly you kind of get to the fringe of it, and it's, you're just up in the mountains. Is is that what it's like? It, it's it's just it's situated in the valley between mountains, so cool. it is it's, it's less compact than Hong Kong, but you sure. can still get anywhere you want to in an hour. And actually, 30 minutes out of the city, you're you're in the mountains with your Ping Si, with amazing hikes. They have incredible trails. So one minute you can be in in the hustle and bustle of the like the CBD area, and then 30 minutes away, you're in the mountains, you're in the hot springs. Awesome. And then hot springs. Hot springs. They have hot springs up in Beitou, and you Indeed. take you can just take a train there, and, and you're basically well, you, yeah, 30 minutes, and you're in a hot spring. That's amazing. What was it like? Um, what was it like living there? Some of a surreal experience, incredibly transformative because I went there with no Chinese ability at all. Right. So my parents and grandparents don't speak Mandarin. So I went there thinking I'm gonna go learn Chinese. And on the first day I got there, I realized I didn't even save the location of my accommodation in Chinese. It was just <laughs> no. English. So I got into a taxi with no internet, trying to describe the location of where I was gonna go. And so I was like using a lot of miming, trying to like explain the university and then like where the students live. Yeah. And I've been on Google Maps like clicking through to see the area. So I kind of roughly knew the area, but I didn't know how to get there. So there was a lot of like miming and yeah, just a lot of... Um, I'm really good at trades now because <laughs> I, I can mime anything I want. I can mime what I want from food. I can yeah. mime where the train station is. I can mind like, yeah, how to get to my accommodation on the first night. That's awesome. Um, so, I, I, sorry, I was just thought, so I think because like, we could go in lots of different directions there. Um, but but language then, because I mean, you know, Hong Kong, English is everywhere, right? Yeah. It's, it's absolutely um, bilingual here, but not the case in Taiwan? Uh, less so. Less so. Um, Hong Kong is just a different um, circumstance. Of course, of course. But Taiwan, there's a real big emphasis on, on learning English. You yeah. have to like learn, you have to pass English to pass your secondary school yeah. to go into university. So everyone learns English. Okay. But it's definitely not the most easiest thing to do in the world, especially coming from like Chinese ethnicity. Yeah. I would go to a lot of stores and they would just speak to me in Chinese and I would just look at them going, what are you saying? I have I have no idea what you're saying. I, I can point to what I the picture I want, but that's basically it. But that must have been a real culture shock for you. It, it was because I, I just assumed it would be easy to go to the shops and buy stuff. Yeah. And on the first day, I remember going and buying food and pointing at at the menu and the lady just looking at me, <laughs> saying like, "What's wrong with you? Like you look Chinese, you look Taiwanese." Yeah. Why, why, don't, why don't you speak Chinese? And so that was just, oh, wait, I have to learn Chinese now to, to really fit in and, and get more of the experience out of it. What did you learn from that experience? I mean, I can't, I can't, I, I guess I can picture what that would be like, but what did, like, when you walked into that for the first time, and then maybe like several months later, what did, what did you learn from that experience? Of kind of like being an outsider where you were perceived to be an insider. Yeah, you know? I think, it, it made me a lot more motivated to learn Mandarin. It made me go to Chinese class with real goals, with real vision in mind. And then I would get immediate practice because I know a lot of some of my friends, they would go and speak to the, China, the Taiwanese shopkeeper and they would just reply to them in English or they would try in the best broken English. Mm. But with me, they would always use Chinese. Mm. So I always had that kind of advantage to, to speak Chinese like straight off the bat. And when we would go for like dinner with some of my exchange friends or other Australians, they would always turn to me first to pay the bill, to settle, to order everything. That's, and so that was really good experience and really good wow. practice. Because and and how, how's your Mandarin now? Uh, it's pretty good. Like yeah. I I work conversationally here yeah. in in, um, in Hong Kong. Like the client we work with is a mainline client. Yeah. So I have to pay the PowerPoint presentations all in Mandarin. Wow. Learn the financial terms and then put it up in our presentation. That's in 18 months. Yeah. Mate, you dominate. That's incredible. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it, it's been a really long road and there's yeah. been lots of times where I just said it's, it's really hard. Mm. But then when you go and have a conversation and you realize, oh, I can actually understand what this person is saying. Like, oh, I can, I can order now. Oh, I can, if I'm lost, I can find my way home. 
that's that that's real change and yeah. it just makes you want to reinvest and learn more and make the most of the experience. I, I love that with like language learning how yeah you've got those milestones mm. where suddenly you're like oh my gosh and then one day you wake up and you've had a dream in another language yeah and you're kind of like wow this yeah. is like it's like you're like rewiring your brain yeah it's phenomenal yeah and when you can start because there because there's signs everywhere and there and there's Chinese text everywhere on the street when I started to realize I can read what that metro station says that says Central Station. I can read the menu now. I can tell that chicken liver. I know not to eat that. <laughs> I like. I like. I know now, and it's just so much changes, and that's that. That that's milestones. That I was like, yes, I I I'm making progress. Awesome. And that just it's kind of followed me throughout my whole experience. That and it's why I'm gonna go back. I'm going to go back to Australia. Yeah. And I'm enrolling in diploma of modern languages. So I'm going to continue awesome. Mandarin, um, and hopefully. Just have a, just hopefully continue that experience nice. because um, when I went back to visit my family in Singapore, actually, the the people I could never have spoken to, mm. they some my distant relatives, they spoke Mandarin, so I saw them as a kid when I went to visit them for Chinese New Year. But our conversations were always like nodding, yeah, because they could speak Mandarin, but they can speak English, and I could only speak English but never Mandarin. So when I went back for Chinese New Year and I met them I could actually speak to them and that was just an insane experience because wow. they've been a part of my life but I've never known them personally oh, man. and now learning through language and learning Mandarin it opened up my family to me essentially like I could speak to my great aunt I could speak to my my great uncles and grand uncles and they have known me my whole life but I've never known them and through Mandarin I, I've been able to know to know and learn from them and that's something I never expected. That's that's a benefit that I went in not even thinking about. Yeah, that's insane. I mean, like, that's actually something that pivots your whole life, right? Because it yeah. doesn't just open up like your experience in Taiwan and Hong Kong, mm -hmm. but even in place like Singapore and with your own family. That's a yeah. transformation. Well, sorry, I have to ask about food. Okay. Because you mentioned chicken liver. Yes. And oh. I, once again, knowing nothing about like Taiwan and um, and and the the, the kind of food there is it the kind of place where you can stumble across just like weird unusual dishes that you yeah. might be confronted by pretty much it's it's did you try any i, I tried all of it because i i'm an absolute foodie i love it food legend so i i love bubble tea and i've heard about all the great Taiwanese like night market snacks in, in taiwan nice um like bubble tea or fried chicken pies and like all the different like i don't know what they they have funny Chinese names that don't always translate well. Like you'll have like fried onion pancake with chili sauce, and but it's like somewhat simpler in Chinese. Um, so awesome. they have all these snacks, and you can you can eat them for days. They're so tasty. They're so cheap as well. They're like one to Australian dollars. Awesome. And yeah, they they're really unhealthy, so you can't eat them every day <laughs> because you'll put on a lot of weight, which I did. Um, but they they like Taiwan's an absolute food paradise. They have or you have your Chinese food and you have fusion food and there's a Japanese influence there as well. Nice. So there's a lot of Japanese food. And you can see that throughout the whole of Taiwan. Yeah. Like each part of Taiwan has has its own cuisine. Like you go to the city and they say, oh, we have this special turkey rice that you have to try. Or like, oh, we have this almond rice that you have to try. And so every city you go to, there's something new to discover. There's, and it's, and it all they all taste really good. And so, so what was the what was the culinary highlight then? The highlight of Taiwan is the bubble tea. <laughs> there's the reason why bubble tea was was made in Taiwan. It's the birthplace of bubble tea. And right. It, oh, the the tea there, the milk there, the pearls there. They're all. I don't think there's a comparable place in the world. Isn't that incredible? Yeah, it's my favorite drink actually. So for those of, for those people who might not know what bubble tea is, can you explain it? Uh, so it's a concoction of. Of, or any type of tea, so you can yep. have green tea, black tea, oolong tea, and they mix it with milk, mm -hmm. and then they add tapioca pearls, which are just really chewy balls. Nice. And they tapioca is what? It's like a. It's a. Uh, it's kind of, right? Yeah, it's kind of like a starchy yep. thing, so it's really chewy. Very veggie. Um, so you mix it with the pearls, and then you chill it. So Taiwan gets really hot in summer. It's about like 35 degrees sometimes yeah. with humidity, and you really feel it. You yeah. sweat so much, and so chilled with ice is the most selling, selling, relaxing, cooling drink you can find because awesome. it's refreshing, 
milk and tea and then chewy, so it's like a little bit of fun. <laughs> it's, it's just this really great experience because the texture is interesting and the, yeah. the drink is sweet and it's refreshing. It's yeah, and it's almost the same price as the Coke, so yeah. why not? That's right, awesome. All right, so Taiwan, so we talked a bit about food and what it's like as, as, as a place. Um, tell me about the study experience there. So where did you study? I studied at the National Taiwan mm -hmm. University. So I was there for awesome one year. Awesome uni. Yeah, awesome incredible. Uni. Best yeah. university in Taiwan. Yeah. Um, right in the center of Taipei. Great campus. In fact, the campus is 1% of Taiwan's entire landmass. <laughs> so they have other campuses just include that, but it's a massive campus. Incredible facilities, library, and, like, and really great students there. They're like, they're really active, they're socially active. There's a great student club. So I think there's over 500 student clubs on campus. Yeah. And people really want to talk to you. They really want to know about your experience. They really want to hear your stories. Mm. Um, and so really friendly. Um, and so I did intensive Mandarin training there. Yep. So that was three hours every day. For how long? From, for, for the whole year. Three hours yeah, every day? Three hours every day. For a whole year? Yeah, with holidays in between. But it's like a 20, 20 week semester. You know, when I, so I learned French, my wife's French, and um, when I learned French, I did it, you know, over, over time, but I yeah. found that language learning, when you start from scratch, is exhausting. Yeah, it, it really is. How do you deal with that? 8 a.m. classes every day, take, 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 takes, or well, takes all the energy out of you. Yeah. But uh, Mandarin was, was the reason I went there, but it wasn't the main reason. Cool, okay. So I did Mandarin in the morning, and yep. then I did my university classes in the afternoon. Nice. So I studied economics and finance. Awesome. So that's like three, four hours in the afternoon, so three hours in Mandarin, four hours of like economics every day. Yeah. Um, so that, it's it's a study load that I wasn't used to. In Australia, I might have 10, 12 hours of contact hours. Yeah. But in Taiwan, a week. in one day, yeah. I had eight, seven hours of class. And, it, and, and after that, is it like one of those kind of places where Afterwards, everyone like goes to the library and like boom, buckles down. Sometimes, or... but most like after eight hours, I I am dead. Like I will go like get dinner and then hang out with friends and then do homework because you have Chinese and like practicing for Mandarin is something you have to do every day. Yeah, you can't let it go because then it will get away from you yeah. easily. Like forget how to write a character. So yeah, no, it was it, it was really tiring, but. At the end of the week, you look back. It's like now I, I know 50 more characters. I can say like a hundred more different things, Amazing. and then on the weekend you reuse that, and then you come back on the next day saying, "Okay, I understand this. Let's ace the test on Monday." Yeah. And then that, that got a really good system in, and it kind of reinforced that you yeah. take breaks, but you also study hard. And so whilst it was really difficult to to work and to, to study and, and focus for like five hours a day on Mandarin. It was, it's really rewarding, and that's how I made, I think, a lot of progress. When you did your economics finance classes, were you doing that in um, Mandarin? No, no, that was English. Okay. English, because yeah, uh, yeah be I, I wouldn't be able to do that in Chinese. Awesome. What was that like? What were those classes like compared to Australia, you know? They, they were really different. So, in Australia, we have a lecture and tutorial system. Yep. In Taiwan, they're a lecture and tutorial all together. Yep. So classes size are about maybe 30 students. And so the lecturer would give the lecture and then there'll be one hour of like problem solving questions, group <laughs> interaction. You work with four other students and you you explain the model, you, you run numbers and you, you find case scenarios. Interesting. Um, so that was, it was, it was less self-study, which I think Australian universities really emphasize. Yep. More guidance and more more you being trying to apply it in, in real life. And you got, it was a really great way to mix with the other Taiwanese because after about well, 20 weeks, 18 weeks of class, you really started to know who they are. Yeah. You, got, you met up for lunch before you went to class. It was, it was a really good experience. Yeah. It was a way of learning that I wasn't really used to, but you get used to it after a while and, and you can make the most out of it if you, you really try and interact with so you've made some pretty good friends in Taiwan then? So yeah, I have, some, I have some really good friends yeah. that I would go back and see in a heartbeat. Were there, were there many um, like non-Taiwanese there? Is it quite diverse? It is quite diverse. There's a lot of European exchange students. Mm -hmm. So I stayed in the international student dorms. And just by being there, you were able to meet people from France, from Germany, from Venezuela, yeah. from, from America, from, from Africa, all, all in your dormitory accommodation and nice. so you go for dinner together and, and I have now friends from all around the world 
we will go traveling together awesome. as well because Taiwanese they they they've, they've really they've seen their own country. So I would go with them on trips. We'll go down to the south, maybe go to the beach, go for a bike ride along the coast. So yeah, we we got really good friends. What, really what if somebody is going to go there and like not not just to study, but what do they have to see? You know, you're going to Taiwan for a week. What what, what are like the key couple of places that you would just have to go and check out? Well, you, in my opinion, you have to start in Taipei. Uh -huh. um, stay there for two three days, experience the food, the culture, maybe go KTV, try the bubble tea. Nice. Uh, and then I would make a trip to Hualien. So that's okay. on the east coast of Taiwan. There, there, there's really cool cliffs that they have there, as well as a gorge, so this national park. It's actually my favorite part of Taiwan. It's called Taroko National Gorge. Yeah. And, well, it's this really gorgeous place, essentially, because you walk along the cliffs, and, you, and you're on the edge in between the valleys, and there's clouds and mist and, and swallows diving in and out. Awesome. It's just this real piece of nature that is only three hours from Taipei. Yeah. And it's just really easy to get to. There's a lot of people there. There's routes are established, but you're in nature, and it's one of those things that makes you stop and stare for a while and think, Earth is pretty incredible. <laughs> That's awesome, isn't it? It's so cool that yeah, you've got such contrast in such a you know condensed you know uh, geographical area, I suppose. Yeah. And now it's it's like the new Colombo plan that's taking you there. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about about what that is and um, and how you ended up doing that. Yeah, so I I knew I've always wanted to learn Mandarin and I was looking at going on exchange and I didn't know if I could afford it financially so and I knew about the new Colombo plan from a few friends and Which uni are you at in Australia? I'm at the University of Western Australia. Right, okay. So I'm from Perth cool. and I was born and raised there. Yep. Um, and so I've heard about this program and I didn't really know much about it, but I knew it would help me pay for my exchange program or, or be a deep experience. So I didn't just want to go on exchange. I wanted to intern in the region. I wanted to experience the culture. And I wanted to go there for preferably two semesters rather than one. Um, and so the new Colombo plan was something that would enable me to do that, enable me to go learn Mandarin, yeah. finally be able to experience another culture as well as be, be enriched and to make those people to people connections, go intern in the region and, and actually get a deep understanding of what Taiwan was like. Awesome. So I applied for the new Colombo plan to the university, mm -hmm. went through a few application processes mm -hmm. and internal rounds, and then I was invited to Canberra for yeah. the interview. Yeah, where well, we spoke. <laughs> yeah, Isn't that, that was over, oh, well, well, two years ago Two years now, ago. And it's been an incredibly transformative experience. Like, Probably the best thing I've done on my undergraduate degree. That's awesome. You know, it, it's kind of funny that, you know, yeah, the last time we would have seen, we would have seen each other at the pre-departure thing too, yeah, maybe. Yeah. And, and then like two years later, here we are sitting on a railing with freaking yeah. Hong Kong in this the background. background is absolutely insane. Just Isn't it crazy? So yeah, we'll get on to Hong Kong, Kong, Kong in a moment, but um, the NCP is obviously like this amazing opportunity. Like I can see that it's transforming, it's like yeah. shining out of you. But, but let's, let's think about, you know, because one of the things that I'm really, really passionate about is that this kind of experience is so... You, you can't describe how much no, it changes you, right? You can't put monetary value on it. You can't put... You can't say that this will change you because it will. It, yeah. it is undoubtedly the, a transformative, life reorientating experience that I've got now. Oh, I have this language, but I also have contacts. I have friends. I have a enhanced understanding of, of Taiwan, I have an enhanced understanding of Hong Kong. That's something that I would have never gotten in Australia. But it's, it's taken me beyond my degree, essentially. It's, it's given me real life experience in, in some of Asia's biggest, most profound cities. Amazing. And so what about like if you're a student that, for example, they, they can't get Hong Kong, uh, sorry, in, in NCP, New Colombo plan, they can't, they don't have any other funding. How important? Is it for them to like just do whatever the hell they can to go and have this kind of experience? I say now at the age of 18, at the age of 20, that's, yeah. that's the time that you should really push yourself because you don't have much to lose but you have a lot to gain. Mm. Um, and 
as a university, you should use your university experience as a platform. Maybe not go on exchange exactly, but there's a lot of societies and clubs at universities you can get into. There's, there's like this Australia China Youth Association that that's based in Australia that bring, it connects you to other Chinese. They do language exchanges. You can go meet mainland Chinese, Taiwanese, Hong Kong people in studying in Australia, and you can meet them, hear their experiences, hear their stories, and then. If you become really good friends with them, you might go visit them, and then you get accommodation paid for. And you just have to pay for the air ticket. Yeah. So there, there are really ways that, and opportunities that you can go. Um, just hustle it. Yeah. <laughs> Beyond that, like you, Australia's Australia's like wages are also really good. Um, that's something I learned in, in like, yeah. living in Asia that you don't get paid a lot, and in Australia there is. If you are able to save, save some money and try go on these experiences yeah. now, because when you're working, you don't have much time. Like doing internships and start interning for six months, I I really didn't have much time. As a student, I would take long weekends off and stuff like that, and that's something I can't do when you're working five days a week. That's so true. I mean, to me, to me, this is like the most incredible investment you can make. I mean, I think I think these scholarship programs are the best investment that Australian government can make in young people. Um, but, but outside of that, like I think it's the most incredible investment people can make in themselves. As you said, that's beautiful. Like, it's like unlimited upside, right? Once you come to a place like this, and you've been to Taipei, yeah. um, and you've been through Singapore, like, like, it's just like your whole world opens up, right? Yeah. And suddenly you realise like, you're not being tied down to just doing one thing, um, which is incredible. Um, yeah, so invest, <laughs> best investment ever, go yeah, do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great brand of endorsement. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Cool, right. let's talk about Hong Kong because yeah. this is bananas, this place. Um, I've been here Truly. for two days and it's like floored me. So what was it like, what was your first impression coming into Hong Kong? I, I came to Hong Kong initially to do a visa run for, um, for my visa to mainland China. And Explain that for me, what's that? The, the visa run? Or? Yeah, the visa run. Yeah, yeah. so um, in, order, in order to basically change visa and to get a visa for mainland China you need to well you need to go to a different country in order to reset your passport so when you come into Hong Kong you come in on a tourist visa yep and then you apply for your your training visa or whatever work visa you have okay. in Hong Kong but if you can't change that in Hong Kong you have to go to an external territory uh -huh. so a third country and then check your passport out of that current visa change to a new visa and then come back into Hong Kong on your new visa. Oh, yeah. Sounds a little bit bureaucratic. It is a little bureaucratic because you have to go physically to a new place and then come back to the exact same place you were. Awesome. But some of my friends in Taiwan, they, they want a 90 day visa. So every 90 days they have to leave Taiwan and come back on yeah. a new visa, which is great if you want to travel. Um, so they would do travels to Japan, travels to Malaysia, travel to Hong Kong, Macau, and they come back and stay in Taiwan. But you, basically, two days you have to fly in and out of a new country. Okay, so your first first impression, you're coming here for a visa run. Yeah. What, what I I remember coming onto the train, coming into Central, and just looking around and saying, looking at all these buildings and saying, a they're so tall, and b they're like so skinny. So and. Yeah, I was just incredibly floored. Like, if you look at this harbor and you look at how blue the water is and how the buildings reflect that, I, I think I was speechless. Like, this is truly a world city. This yeah. is truly, this is, this is just insane. I, you don't really have words to put into it because it's just this, it's just this incredible city that I couldn't really describe to you. Like, yeah. I could describe it as like a skyscraper metropolis, like a city of superlatives, but. That's probably, that only gets you so far. You have to come here and experience it. I think that's really true, you know. The thing that kind of, I, I actually came down right right where we're sitting now, um, yesterday morning, super early, at five o'clock, and there was just nobody here. And like today, there's, you know, like thousands of people everywhere. And at yeah. night when the light show's going on, there's people everywhere. But it's it's almost like it's got it's got its own personality. Mm. You know, like being here first thing in the morning, it was like the place was asleep. Yeah. And it was like super calm, and like you had it to yourself, but you could feel the vibe. Like you look at you look at that skyline, yeah. and you think about not just the the people energy, but the the business energy and the cultural energy. And there's so much condensed in here. Yeah, that's just like just 
like creating output for the rest of the world. Yeah, it's coming from here. And and this this that energy that you feel here has is multiplied and transformed mm. all around the world. We look at the people around here, and there are probably what fifty different nationalities here. Oh yeah, and they have a connection to every country in every corner of the world, and that just makes Hong Kong a world city. Mm. What happens here has impact all around the world, not only in Australia but in America, in South America, in Africa, in Europe. That's something that I couldn't get in Perth back home. Yeah. And just to look at that skyline and think, what a million people are in those buildings. That's insane. There's half the population of Perth in a couple of buildings. That is insane. And just you can't, you can't, you can't not think of the gravity of the city because it, its weight around the world is is really hard to Yeah, it's, it's it's not quite the the, the like Perth skyline from the Swan River. Is yeah, it? no, definitely not. I think maybe like five buildings is all we have in Perth. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah, it is. I mean, it is spectacular in in that regard. Um, and, and so what does that mean? Because there's such a density of people. I went, I was in Mong Kok um, on my first night. That is like something I've never seen before. Tell me about what it's like to have that density of people around you. Oh, that's, you, you feel it every morning on the commute to work when you're in a train and there's no space to, to put your bag, to, to stand or, it's kind of intoxicating almost, but it, you look around and Everyone is going to work, everyone has a clear goal in mind and that it's kind of it's it's this experience that you're in you're in a city, your your lives are interconnected with so many people and everyone is here for a reason and everyone's doing work or study or, or something. So there's so many stories to tell and there's so many people to meet. Yeah. That that's something that you don't get in Perth. That's something that I didn't get at university because just by having everyone being in a, such a confined space, your sense of community is greater, your sense mm. of urgency, your sense of belonging is also enriched, I think. Mm. Because you, you're, everywhere you go, you see people. Yeah. You have that intense connection with them. You might look at them in the train, you might look at them across the office, and then that just by having that look at the person, you're, mm. you're connected, you have, you have a sense of you have a sense of belonging almost in the city. Like as a foreigner, you don't really find a sense of home in a lot of places. Yeah. Right? Here in Hong Kong, you have the community of Australians. You have the community in your office. You have these people all around you. Mm -hmm. That that kind of makes you feel like Hong Kong is your home already. It just gives you a sense of 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 belonging, and that's what I think the city is really good at doing. That's amazing. If you actually think about that, like you can walk into a place and it feels like home yeah. very, very quickly is amazing. Yeah. And so what have you been doing here? I've been interning, interning. at Deloitte. Oh, wow, that's yeah. big. Yeah, it's, it's just, well, doing consulting work with them. Yeah. And, and you see this really big change in the Hong Kong world, a world finance hub. And I get to work with mainland clients, work with Hong Kong businesses. Yeah. And they're all investing in financial technology, all investing in fintech using all the modern technology that's available to enrich the financial products that you have. And this is no better place in the world to be. This yeah, is well. a world of the finance hub of Asia. There's so much activity, so much business going on here. Yeah. And that there's so much to learn here. I think I've learned in one month what I could have learned in maybe six months or a year in Australia. How, how long has the internship been? Uh, well, I just come been interning for yeah. a month. Wow. And I've learned an insane amount just there. In those four weeks already yeah. has been, I've, I've worked in Mandarin, I speak, have Mandarin speaking clients, I have Cantonese speaking colleagues, I have English speaking colleagues. The office is so diverse. That's nice. And it's this ecosystem of, of people that is, that is so diverse and rich that brings so many new ideas to the table. And it just makes work really exciting. At meetings that we have, everyone has different perspectives. Everyone has different ideas, and that just makes a better, well-rounded product that we get to serve to the client. And it's, I mean, this kind of experience, and it's not just in Perth, I reckon, but for a university student anywhere, to have that experience where suddenly, like, you're in a world financial hub, yeah. working for like one of the world's biggest consulting firms, doing like real work. Yeah. Like, what does that do to your? Like your confidence. It, it makes you so much more ready for, for work. Yeah. Because you not only have you have that experience, but you have practical world knowledge of what it's like 
you have that cultural nuances, you have that cultural understanding that yeah. you won't get um, in, no, well, you will get, but not to the same degree, and not China and not Chinese specific. Yeah. But that, it also makes you, when you go to a client meeting, you can, you can talk to them. You, you, because you've done it before, you've had that experience, you've done your research, you talked to clients, you've met people, you've done background, understanding, you've read a lot. You have your confidence level just just increases tenfold because you now you're confident that you can do it. And after you've worked with those clients and you say yes, they believe in you, and yes, the feedback you've gotten has been critical, but you learn from that. That learning process of of working, learning, like presenting, like getting feedback, that just builds your confidence tenfold. And you see that every day I go into the office, I learn something new. What's the, what's the word culture like here? It, it's really different. Yeah. Um, it's pretty different though because whilst working times are quite flexible, when you're in the office it, it, you work and you work really hard but the work is interesting because you work with people from different backgrounds. Like I said before. Um, can, can you sorry, can you break that down for me? So when you say like work hours are kind of flexible, yeah. I know you've been working your butt off because we were exchanging some messages to line up this chat. Yeah. And so you're like, oh, just finishing some stuff off. And, yeah. been, and I heard from some of your friends here too that like you've been putting in some massive hours. Yeah. It's like kind of flexible. What does it mean to be flexible? And then what does it mean like like that you work hard? So you have periods of like clock when you're really on the project and the project has deadlines that you have to meet. Yeah. And then you have softer times where there's not a lot of stuff. You're waiting for feedback from the client. Sure. So you when you're hearing back from feedback from the client, then working out is a little bit more flexible because you, you, there's not a lot to do. You can only go so far in background research. You can run your numbers again. You can you can check your business model and you can like you can you can look at what what works, what doesn't work. Um, but you really want to have the feedback from the client. So, but when the client when you're presenting to the client and those lead up to the days where you're presenting it. It's, it's really, really busy because you have, you have to make sure that everything is right. Everything has been double, triple checked. Yeah. And so you're putting in hours, like until 10, maybe even later. You're calling clients in the mainland. You're, you're checking those numbers with them. You're doing auditing processes. You're doing a lot of, lot of work. And yeah. you're putting it all in the presentation slide to get checked by the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. And so in those times of really go, those periods of of, of work, you really work really, really hard. Yeah. And everyone in the office is putting in those late nights or working yeah, right. as a team to do those long hours. That must be very satisfying to some extent, I mean, because then you, I mean, you, you reap what you sow, right? Like, yeah. you know, you put in that work, but when, like, something comes off, boom, yeah. it's all on you, right? Yeah. It's all yours. Mm. Or the team, I should say. The yeah. team, well, yeah. it, you, all ben you all contribute to the team, so yeah. you work as a team, then you, you get the benefits of the team as well. But you also, when you see your slide up and you see your numbers there and you see your projections and the client really likes it and the client's happy with it, you kind of feel almost self-validated that the work has been, you, your work is rewarded. Like you've done, you put in all those long hours and it wasn't for nothing. That's, that's something that's really impactful. And as, as a uni student, as a third year, 20 year old uni student, to have that experience in a world financial hub like Hong Kong, that's, that's something I never thought I would ever get get to achieve. Oh, congratulations. Um, are you going to follow that when you get home, do you think? Stay in that kind of consult, financial consulting sort of space? Yeah, so definitely. Um, I'm looking at internships now at the end of the year, actually. Nice. So, just going So if you're watching this... Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> subtle plug. Subtle plug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I really want to continue my Chinese because being here, I've realized that China at the way they're growing, at how fast and how how fast they're developing, that's something that I've never seen before. And you really feel it working in a city like Hong Kong. There's events every night. They're implementing fintech and AI and blockchain into the financial products. Yeah. It's no longer just a buzzword. It's yeah. actually being effective like and it's being used. Um, and that's something that I kind of want to take back to Australia. It's kind of the goal of the new global plan as well. Take those ideas and take those experiences that you have and take them back to Australia and work with companies and work with students and try to build up that, that experience and all those knowledge that you've gained 
in Australia as well. So that's something I definitely want to continue going back as an alumni and as, and as a former NCP scholar, being able to work with other students in Australia, that's something that I'm really looking forward to doing. Awesome, and, and, and then when, where's next? Are you, are you, do you want to come back here? Yeah, I, I really want to come back. Finish uni. I really want to come back to Hong Kong, Taiwan, maybe China, because this is, this is where I think the growth is in, in, in the world. This is something that you're seeing will change. Like 20 years ago, Hong Kong was definitely not like this. And in the mainland, you're seeing growth and development on an unprecedented scale. Mm. And that's something I really want to get into. So not only for Australian businesses, as Australians living in China, as Australians living in, in Hong Kong and Taiwan, there are 1.2 million Chinese, uh, Australians of Chinese descent living in Australia. Mm -hmm. And we have that instant connection, we have that bond, and we have that link. And Australia is eventually, and Australia is now, we're really having a big trading relationship with China. We have this relationship with Taiwan, we have this relationship with Hong Kong, and that's only going to get stronger and build as we go forward. Sure. And I think we're going to see in, in finance, in banking, in, in commerce, really, we're going to see that connection with China, that connection with Asia. Yeah. And that's going to continue in, into, well, into the forefront of the future. And, and uh, so I know you're 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 going home like this week, right? Like yeah. in a week. Um, how do you feel? Uh, it's bittersweet, definitely, because after coming and done this incredible 18 month exchange and 18 month internship experience, I don't really know what to think about going back. Yes, mm. I have family and friends there, and I get to go back and look, do university at home. I'm giving up this incredible experience I've had here. The experiences, the stories, the friends I've made here, I'm going to keep with me for the rest of my life. Yeah. So I'm definitely going to be back. The New Colombo Plan experience has changed my attitude and perspective towards the Indo-Pacific region. And I'm going to have that for the rest of my life. Awesome. And so, um, if, uh, like, if, if you were going to tell one story about your overseas study experience, what would it be? Uh, the, so like if I met you for the first time yeah. and I was like, oh, you've just been to Hong Kong and Taiwan, like, yeah. tell me something. Oh, I... Is your so mind many, just like going... There's, there's <laughs> so many stories, like, I, I, I can't pinpoint it because there's been days where like it's been... I wanted to go home because it's been so hard, but then there's days where you're, you're in the mountains or you're at the beach or yeah. you're in a city like this and you just stop and think, yeah. like, I'm, I'm here, I'm, I'm in country. I'm experiencing things I would never get back home. I'm experiencing culture, I'm experiencing knowledge, I'm getting stuff that will change my life forever. Yeah. And when I think about that, I don't really want to leave because I, I'm, I've gotten used to it. I've made a home for myself here in Hong Kong. Yeah. I've made a home for myself in Taiwan. Awesome. And that's something that you never, you never really like to say goodbye to home, do you? It's true, it's true. So, um, I just want to ask you a quick question about, you know, you, you said like there have been days that have been so hard. Yeah. Why? Um, I mean, outside of language, right? Like, because yeah. language is super, super confronting, super challenging. And, yeah. Well, those days, that, well, actually I interned in, in Beijing as well. Oh, so wow. I think I mentioned that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so there was days when the pollution was really bad and you're there and it's cold. You're in your apartment, yeah. you're all alone and you don't have that friendship group and you don't have that family support that you have in, in um, when, you, when you're overseas and you're interning in a foreign country. Some days where the application process is too hard, the visa process is too hard. The bureaucracy, yeah, the sure. The bureaucracy is hard, the pollution is really hard, you're missing your friends and family, you're missing the taste of home, and you're just there and you think, oh, I could just, if I go back, everything will be fine. Yeah. But then you start to think about what you're learning, what, what your work is doing. How, how much you've changed, what you're learning, then you start to realize that's something you can't give up. And that's something that's worth staying in China for, that's worth staying in Taiwan, staying in Hong Kong for. That, that gets you through those really hard days of, I want to go home, I think it's enough. Do you think you're more resilient now, as a result? Absolutely. Yeah. And there's been times where I have, have decided, oh, this work permit is too hard, I'm just going to move country, or like this, this application process is too laborious and this bureaucracy is too hard but you you have a look and you think objectively that this is what I'm going to do, I'm going to intern here and I'm going to gain the experience, I'm going to meet people, I'm going to learn a lot. That 
like maybe one day of bureaucracy is, is worth all that experience yeah, that right. you have. And so, so if like there was Cameron version 1.0 before you left, yeah. What's Cameron? Like, what's the biggest difference between version one and version two who you are now? Excluding like the language stuff and yeah. excluding like the resilience, what, what what else has been like the biggest thing that's shifted for you? I think it's my mindset now. Yeah. Now that if someone tells me, oh, do you want to work in Vietnam? I'll be like, yeah, absolutely, I'll go. Or if you want to work in in, in, in France or Japan, yeah, absolutely. I think that mindset where I had before, I was a little bit indecisive, like, oh, do I want to do that? Now it's like, yes, I, I, mean, I would go. Like, if there's something that I can learn from it, and it's a value I can add, I would say absolutely go for it. Awesome, man. It's been so good to chat. Yeah. Um, I and mean, we've talked a little bit about what it's like to live in live in Hong Kong and, and be here, which has been amazing. Um, I'm on the plane this, this evening. I'm like so bummed that you know it's 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 under your skin straight away. This place. This morning yeah. I went up and hiked up Lions um, Lions Rock, which is beautiful. I think that's another thing about this city is that yeah. you don't realise just the other side of that is like all of this amazing scenery and yeah. everything like that. You know, you don't realise the scale in Hong Kong. Yeah. I think because you're here. You look up and there's 60 stories above you, yeah. and then there's thousands of buildings exactly like that, yeah. all along the coastline, and you don't realize that until you get up to a place like Lion Rock and you overlook the whole city, the harbor, and you just go, "Wow, this this city is incredible." Somebody said to me yesterday, actually, that that's that's also one of the magical things about this city is that, mm. like, you can be so close to it, and, and I think um, I think I was saying about you can sit on a rooftop. Right, yeah. and and you've got your own little bubble of peace yeah. in amongst this incredible, thriving, heaving mass of humanity, yeah. which is super special and something you don't experience anywhere else either. So. Yeah, you can lose yourself in the city, but you can the city can also lose you a bit. Yeah, awesome. What do you think it's going to be like when you get off the plane in Australia in a week's time? Less. <laughs> yeah, less. less. Um, oh. It'll be great to see family. I think that's the most exciting thing, and the, the thing I'm most excited about getting to see my family again. But then also, I really miss some Australian food. Yeah. I miss the fresh air. I miss a little bit of space, like Hong Kong is great to have my small room, but it's gonna be nice to stretch my feet out a little bit, go for a run, maybe drive again. I haven't driven for <laughs> one and a half years because public transport in these days is so great. It's gonna what, be... What, what do you think, what do you think your, your family is gonna notice is different in you? I think the independence because yeah. I was 18 when I left for NTP and so I just I did one year of uni in Australia and then I left for this incredible experience yeah and I remember your interview man like you you nailed your interview it was incredible and we just thought this this guy's gonna go somewhere so it's so incredible to see like two years later yeah and like you've got this like you're sitting here and you're like gonna fucking con sorry excuse me but you're gonna fucking conquer the world right you know like nothing's gonna stop you I think that that's what NTP does it empowers you yeah. and not only it gives you that platform, but it's what you do on that platform. It's what you make the most out of the experience, you're going to get as much as you put in, you're going to get all that back. So it's something that's up to you to do. So I would say the independence thing is a bit back to me. Like, now if I want to apply or I work for companies, if I want to go for a meeting, if I want to network with someone, I, I don't have any more fear that it's not, that, that that's not right. It's, I, I think I have something to say and I think that I can learn a lot from you and you potentially can learn a lot from me. That's what NCP has empowered me to do. So independence is probably what I would say is the biggest thing. Nice. And if somebody was sitting there thinking to themselves, oh look, I'm interested in this overseas study thing. I'm kind of curious about Asia, but oh, it seems too scary. What would you say to them? I would say, well, what, what do you think is scary about it? Is it the language? Is it the new culture? Is it being away from home? But then think about language. You have so many Australians living here in Hong Kong. Language isn't really an issue here in Hong Kong. It might be in other cities, but in every city, English is so international. And language is actually something you can learn, you can pick up really easily. Like, you might not need to be fluent in language. You might just need some conversation, how to order food. Once you know how to say hamburger, and you know how to like say beef, you're kind of set, right? You can go to McDonald's and order a beef hamburger. And you know beef noodles. And you yeah. will never starve. You will never starve. So and Except then if you're vegetarian, then you need to know what tofu is. But. Yeah, but I, you can. There's vegetarian places everywhere as well. So 
I wouldn't really worry about that. I would say worry when you get into location and when you get there, because when you're in the city like this, food is something that becomes really small. And there's vlogs, there's the internet, you have friends, you have other Australians in those countries and cities. There are instant connections you can get and they can help you show around. I think in coming to Hong Kong and having that friendship group already in place, that, that made the experience so much better because they took me to this dessert shop in the middle of nowhere that I would have never gone and said this is the best mango pudding in the whole of Hong Kong. <laughs> and when you sit there and you try that, every single fear about if I could eat just goes away because you're in there in the moment. Nice. Um, another thing that I, I sort of think about is like people are really worried about graduating on time um, and and sometimes you know like this kind of experience studying overseas interning um, even doing things like volunteering short courses it can even like set people back right. but how much like what do you say to somebody who's thinking like oh I'd love to but I'll, I'll graduate six months later um, is this more valuable I, I would 100% say it's more valuable I'm probably the wrong person to ask for this because I extended my degree by two years to come on NCP. No, I you the perfect person yeah, to, to yeah. talk about. Um, but yeah, I, I would say absolutely do it because what you can get for this is the best, this is the most malleable part of your life. This yeah. is the time where you're the most open to change, but you can also learn a lot from it. Yeah. You hear a lot of people when in, in like in Deloitte and your seniors, they say, oh, I wish I was doing what you're doing now because at my age, I can't do it. They say, no, there's not really an age that you can or cannot do it, but they tell me that that's the one thing that they regret doing. They regret going on exchange, they regret doing internship. And so I have no regrets at Not all. doing those things. Yeah, not doing those not things. Not doing those things, yeah. Not doing an internship yeah. and not going on exchange is probably yeah. the biggest regret for university. Yeah. Because there's that platform. Universities are so supportive of you going on exchange. Yeah. They're really supportive of you doing internships. And so why not why not make the most of that opportunity? You have you study four weeks a year per semester, so 24 weeks out of 52 weeks of a year, you have maybe one or two weeks there. You can do two weeks, you can do a short course in Hong Kong, you can do a month internship in a, in a, a company, or you can go learn a language for two weeks. That, that two weeks is going to be probably, in my opinion, some of your best experiences that you have at university. And just try to make the time. Just I know it sounds really hard to try and make time and, tr and when you're trying to, to graduate but this is this is probably some of the best experiences you're going to have and so why not extend that by one year or two years take out a new major do an honors year overseas do ncp do an internship for six months you're still working you're still adding to your self-value you're still adding to your cv so you're not i wouldn't say it's it's a it's a bad thing to do i would say it's something you're going to learn a lot from and it's what you make from the experience. If you go in with the mindset that you're not going to get a lot from it, you're not really going to get a lot from it. But if you go into the mindset you're saying, I'm going to learn a lot from this experience. I'm going to develop my career, I'm going to develop my professional, my professional acumen. That's what you're going to get out of it. You're going to get as much as you put in. So I would say 100% do it. Unlimited upside. Unlimited upside. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Hey Cameron, it's been awesome chatting with you. It's so good to see you after two yes. years and I think That's what's right. awesome about this is you know like I know at some point you know in a couple of years time maybe five years time maybe ten years time I'm gonna look and be like we sat here at Hong Kong Harbour had this awesome chat and now now look where you've you know where, where you've gotten to it's gonna be amazing so I look forward to watching that adventure mate so look forward to awesome right. so great to chat with you so until next time on a life that travels I'm Rob Licky it's been awesome talking with Cameron He and uh, we'll see you next time Bye-bye yeah. from Hong Kong. Bye. <laughs>